Hi there, and welcome to Northview Online. We're so glad you're here to join us for this week's sermon. The Bible is the perfect guide for our lives as followers of Jesus, and we pray that this message helps you draw nearer to God. At Northview, we believe that living our faith is meant to be done together. If you're looking for a church community, we would love for you to visit one of our campuses, or we can help find a great church near you. And don't forget about all the other amazing resources we have to offer, like Northview Kids Online, original songs, podcasts, and more. You can find everything you need on our website, northview.org. You'll want to have your Bibles. We're going to be reading a chunk from 1 Corinthians 15 about midway through the sermon. Uh, Not a long section there, but the longest section on the resurrection in the New Testament. We're going to anchor there. Uh, But I just want to uh, just add my welcome uh, to be here and knowing that the majority of people who come into an Easter service on a weekend have a basic understanding of what this weekend is all about. Uh, Regardless of what goes on in the culture around us, we know that it is more than just simply a springtime reawakening of the earth and that the flowers are blooming again and that it's more than the Easter bunny and chocolates and eggs. We know that. Uh, It is the story that we celebrate, the victory of Jesus over death and the grave and the hope that we have in the resurrection of Jesus. So we remembered on Friday that Jesus was executed that he was executed by the most horrific form of capital punishment that had been perfected by the Roman armies for a number of years. So horrific was that death that there's a whole word group that has come out of the crucifixion. Uh, Our English word excruciating comes from that term, the cross, and the agony that Jesus endured at the hands of the Romans. And how as he passed, his body was whisked away quickly before sundown. We're told that there were two men in John 19, a man named Joseph and a man named Nicodemus took his body. They wrapped it in linen and spices as was a custom for the Jewish burial. They did it quickly because sundown was coming. We're told in Luke 23 that a group of women were there watching as they prepared his body. But it was sundown and they needed to get home because it was on the eve of the Sabbath. And so on the Sabbath day, they needed to be at home resting. But on that Sabbath day, plans were also underway. And I think it's a little humorous that Luke includes that little text that the women were there watching because on Sunday morning, those women go to finish the job. That's really, I think, what was happening. They had been there. They saw Joseph and Nicodemus quickly wrapping the body and applying spices. We're told that, that Nicodemus brought along. But the women made plans, and four were named. We have the two Marys. We have Joanna. We have Salome. And then we have other women. So it could have been six, eight, ten women. Why so many? Well, there was a heavy stone, six to eight hundred pound stone. It would take a good number of strong women to move that stone. But I think that they were going to finish what the guys didn't get right on Friday night. That's why they went. And they got there to the garden tomb, and the stone was already rolled away. And the message of Easter is the central message of the early church. It was and is that the power of the resurrected Christ given to his people that would enable them to live godly lives, and it became the central cry of the early church. And so the cross was and it is critical to the equation, the cross that we hang on the walls of our churches. But it was not exclusively and maybe not even predominantly the cross that dominated the early church. It was that the Christ had been raised and that a new day had come. That the battle with sin and death in the grave had been dealt a decisive blow. Satan himself knew that he no longer was to be feared or followed because a new day in human history had dawned. One walked out of the tomb fully alive. Satan lost his grasp. Have you ever wondered why the Christian church chose the logo that we chose? Did we choose the wrong one, perhaps? So we live in a day where you are inundated uh, with advertising and marketing slogans and cliches and images. It just runs through our media 24-7. And the wisest of media outlets and brand outlets have minimalized it down to just a few symbols and a few words. So if I put up these symbols, you will get the subliminal messages uh, embedded in them. Uh, These are very familiar images. Uh, Wendy's home cooking, but if you take note, there's a little mom around her collar. The FedEx symbol that has the 
arrow in the middle of it. If Once you see it, you won't unsee it. Amazon, the smiley Amazon, but it also has the everything from A to Z that you need. Baskin Robbs 31's flavors, the BR, the 31 that is there, and then Tostitos. Once you see the two people dipping their chip in the middle of the Tostitos, you will never forget it. But even the wisest remove the words entirely. So throw up another screen, and I'm sure that these eight images, without a single word, you know exactly which every one of these images are. Do you not? Probably not a person in the room who cannot identify all of those images. Images and the sports world has picked up on it as well. Throw another one up. You don't even need the name to know which teams these represent. You know them all. One single logo. So, someone has said that the three primary images to represent the life of the Christ are the cradle, the cross, and the crown. The cradle representing the humility of Christ that he took on the form of an infant, which we celebrate at Christmas. The cross, of course, his crucifixion for our sin, and then the crown that he is the exalted king sitting at the Father's right hand, that he is indeed ruling and reigning, that he is sovereign over the the universe. And we've used all three of these images in various sermons over the years, the cradle, the cross, and the crown. And there is no question that the cross is the best known representation for Christianity for at least the last 1,600 years. But have you ever stopped to think about why? Because there is no scripture verse, you will not find it in the Bible, where it says, thou shalt hang a cross in thy church. Or thou shalt have a tattoo of the cross on thy skin. Or you shall wear a cross around your neck as a piece of jewelry. In fact, in the first century, it would have been really strange. It would have seemed crazy to decorate with or to wear the cross as jewelry because it was the Roman executionary tool. It would be like wearing a tiny little electric chair around your neck (laughs) or a guillotine on the wall of your home. So why the cross? And yet, no matter where you go in the world today, the moment you see the cross, you are reminded of the sacrifice that Jesus paid for the sins of humanity. And it might sound sacrilegious to even suggest that there might be a better icon to represent our faith. But Easter reminds us that the story of Jesus did not end at the cross. It didn't end at Calvary. It is not good news that the Savior died, period. It is only good news that he died and he was raised to life again. And so Easter reminds us that the story of Christ is central. There is no question that the resurrection was the central message of the early church. Their cry in those early years was the power of the resurrection given to God's people and that the victory was ours. And while the cross was and is critical, it was not predominantly what they were on about. It was that Christ had been raised. So stay with me because I want to build an argument today. Let's remind ourselves really quickly of the greater story, and I'll just Fasten your seatbelts and through fast forward what we know of this story of the week of the Passover, that Jesus was crucified significantly during Passover week, the celebration when a lamb was slaughtered, the blood on the doorpost, so that the death angel would pass over and they would escape from Egypt. And now Jesus, the lamb who takes away the sins of the world, the Passover lamb is sacrificed Passover week. That is significant. And all four Gospels record that on the first day of the week, so now the first day of the next week, Jesus is raised. And it just so happens that that first day of the next week is the first day of the first feast of first fruits. That symbolism should not be lost. Like the first head of wheat that is ripe, like the first cluster of grapes that are ripe, from the harvest and more yet to come. Over the next five weeks, they would celebrate the harvest and the festival of weeks ultimately and Pentecost when harvest was finalized. But the first fruits, there's more to come. And in Acts 1 verse 3, that tells us that Jesus spent the next 40 days with his disciples. Corinthians 15, which we'll read in a bit, says he appeared to over 500. Many of them were still alive when Paul was writing. And ultimately, we know the story. He commissions his disciples with the Great Commission, go into all the world and make disciples. But before you go, wait. Wait for the Holy Spirit to come, which they did. And 10 days later, huddled in an upper room in Jerusalem, the Holy Spirit falls on Pentecost Sunday, 
And within a few days, Jerusalem is upside down with their explosive claims. Peter, Peter who was uneducated, untrained, Peter who had never been to Bible school or seminary, Peter who had his explosive temper and his foul mouth, Peter who just a few weeks earlier had denied that he even knew Jesus and cursed under his breath, Peter now in Acts 2 stands up to preach and it's significant, it is Pentecost weekend. The Holy Spirit has fallen with tongues of fire, but Peter doesn't stand up and start preaching about all the signs and wonders and all the miracles and the fact that we're speaking in tongues that we've never learned. He doesn't talk about any of that. He stands up and preaches what? Christ crucified and raised from the dead. This message, this Jesus that you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ by raising him from the dead. And in Acts 4, the leaders pull in Peter and John. They've healed a lame man and they're like, what are you on about? Where is this power coming from? And they say to them, the power is in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus has set the captives free, the power for a new way of living. Satan has been defeated. They answer with the resurrection. Okay, then one more story. Later, Acts 9, a rebellious man named Saul is radically converted when Jesus comes to him in a vision on the Damascus road. His name is changed to Paul, and Paul becomes the great missionary statesman of the New Testament. He wrote 12 of the New Testament letters, 13 if you believe he wrote Hebrews. He debated in the secular arenas of the great metropolitan cities of his day, and Paul's message, you guessed it, was Jesus Christ crucified yet risen in victory. Understanding and preaching the implications of the resurrection became the major preoccupation in Paul's life. So just listen to one example. One of many. When he wrote to the Ephesian church, he said this, I pray for you that having the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you. What are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints? And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power that you would know his hope, his riches, and his power toward us who believe, now listen, according to, to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places. Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. Paul is like, I want you to know the hope and the riches and the power. What of the resurrected Christ? That the same power that raised Jesus from the dead is available to you. Ephesian church, this Ephesian church that was in the hotbed, this temple of Diana, the temple of Artemis, the the greatest cultic worship center in Asia Minor at that point in time, tens of thousands of people making pilgrimage every year to Ephesus to come and worship at the temple of Diana. And Paul stands up and says, I want you to know the power of the resurrected Christ. Walk out of the temple of Diana and walk into a relationship with Jesus. And what Paul is saying is here is I want you to know experientially the victory and the power that we have in Jesus. So the empty tomb and victory over sin and death in the grave was the rallying cry of the early church. The phrase was Christus victor, that Christ is victorious or that Jesus Christ is Lord. Christus victor was on their lips continuously. So Paul writes the longest defense of the resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15. It's 58 long verses. We're going to read just 10 of them. Just a portion of this great defense when he says, Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you, which you have received, in which you stand, and by which you are being saved. For I delivered to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day in accordance to the scriptures. And and then he goes on to say, he appeared to the 12, he appeared to 500, and ultimately he appeared to me, Paul said. And then some are arguing with Paul. There is no resurrection of the dead. You're crazy, Paul. What are you on about? And then he goes on in verse 20 to say, but Christ has been raised from the dead. Argue all you want, but he has been raised, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by man came death, by a man has also come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. 
But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, and then it is coming those who belong to him. There it is, Christ the first fruits, the precursor of all who will come. And then he goes on to say this, and then the end will come. You want to know the end times? You want to know when the end is going to all get wrapped up? Paul tells us right here. The end will come when he, Jesus, delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every ruler, rule and authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his his feet. And the text goes on to say, and then he hands it back to the Father and says, it's all done, Lord. Now you are sovereign over it all. And then the final concluding verse to this text is, therefore, my beloved brothers and sisters, be steadfast and movable and always abound in the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Why? Because of the hope of the resurrection. You see, we're currently living in that in-between period what theologians call the already but not yet kingdom. It's already here. Jesus has already accomplished it. He's already finished, done the work, everything that needs to be done. The war is over. The battle has been won. We're fighting a battle that's already been won. Do you sound familiar? The enemy has been defeated. And this became the central message of the New Testament church. So much so, and now I'll come back to my point that was disturbing you before. So much so that the cross, which today we take for granted, is simply the centerpiece of our Christian faith, that the cross, the best-known symbol of the Christian church, didn't actually start appearing in Christian art until well into the 5th century. It didn't show up in Christian art until the 400s. Art historian Kenneth Clark says this, we have grown so used to the idea that the crucifixion is the supreme symbol of Christianity, that it is a shock to realize how late in the history of Christian art its power was recognized. In the first art of Christianity, it hardly appears. And the earliest example on the doors of Santa Sabina in Rome around 430 AD is stuck away in a corner almost out of sight. Early Christian art is concerned with miracles, healings, and with hopeful aspects of the faith like the ascension and the resurrection. Okay, now please do not hear what I am not saying. All emails go to Ezra at Northview.org. <laughs> please don't hear what I am not saying. I am in no way suggesting that we should turn away from the cross as an image of our faith. But I am simply pointing out that it was the resurrection that dominated the early teaching of the church. It was the power of God over the forces of evil demonstrated in the resurrection that Christ was indeed victorious. And if you wonder where I'm headed with it, well, just stay with me, because I think it's incredibly significant. At least it was significant for me when it finally landed that Easter is the pinnacle of the Christian calendar. That everything in the Old Testament points forward to this day and looked forward to it. Everything since points back to this day of victory and then forward to the ultimate culmination. And so Easter should be the greatest celebration of our lives, but it shouldn't just be one day of the year. It should be every day of our lives that we live resurrection lives. And sadly, and here is finally the point that I'm trying to make that I believe that way too many of us celebrate Easter but live Friday lives. I think that way too many of us live in the darkness and in the fear and the struggle. Still bound by the power of sin, we celebrate Sunday but we live Friday. We acknowledge Sunday, we know all our theology, we can rattle it off, and yet the daily life is lived under the power of sin and death in the grave. And the question I have is whether we need to ponder more the power and ponder with wide-eyed amazement the empty tomb and yes, the cross, but more so the empty tomb that our lives would include a joyful celebration of Friday, but living in the victory of Sunday. So flip that phrase around, celebrating Friday, but living Sunday, celebrating the victory that was purchased at the cross, but knowing that we live now in the new day of the week. So have we unintentionally attached ourselves to just one aspect of the story, adopted just one icon, one symbol that is subtly 
devalued another. As I said earlier, that Jesus died in and of itself is not good news. It is that he died and he rose again that makes it good news. That the battle was fought at the cross and the victory was displayed at the tomb. Christus victor, Christ is Lord over sin and death in the grave. And so each of our lives is part of this great cosmic story. It is the one great story that dwarfs all the others. Let me remind you of the cosmic story of the universe, which is the battle for the right to rule and reign the universe. It is the battle for the worship of the human race, for the rightful place of supremacy, the battle for supreme rule in each one of our lives. And we are told that that battle began way back. Romans, Romans, not Romans, Revelation 12. Now war arose in heaven. When did this war take place? That's a very interesting thing to think about. Because this is a battle between angelic beings and God the Father. And ultimately, Satan is cast out of heaven. We know in the creation, the angels were part of creation, and we know that God said everything was good. So somewhere between the creation account and Adam's temptation, this war takes place. There was war in heaven. The great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who's called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth. And that short paragraph introduces to us the cosmic story of all our lives. And you can choose to not believe it and you can choose to ignore it, but this is how the Bible tells us that everything that could possibly go wrong in this world around us got started. And you're like, do you believe that? I firmly believe it that everything that could go wrong was caused ultimately by this beginning war. And that little paragraph introduces this battle. And if you want the short version, the original creation was perfect. It was absolute in beauty and order until that serpent began his trade of deception. And from that day forward, the world has been unraveling coming unhinged, going from what God said was good, 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 very good, to a chaotic world. Now just stay with me a moment. Because if you're listening to the agenda of the secular, atheistic, or evolutionary, or progressive, whatever you want to call it, worldview, that educational system tells us the opposite. That educational system tells us that We came out of chaos, that the universe was in chaos, just some random act of time and chance. No one knows ultimately where it came from at the beginning, but over billions and billions of years, life somehow sprang spontaneously and accidentally out of that chaos. And then billions of years further, life evolved first into a single cell, then multiple cells, and then plant and animal life, mutating, adapting, and growing better and stronger, more advanced and enlightened. And the pinnacle so far of that evolution process is the human species. Look around you. And with billions of years more, we will evolve yet further. And just think the world tells us with education and enlightenment and reason and rational thought and all the wisdom that we have gained, the world is becoming a better and better place day by day, growing stronger and smarter and wiser more fully evolved, more enlightened, better and better every year. The humanist worldview says that order grows out of chaos. (laughs) I was just going to say, those of you who are looking at the world the way it really is would say you are a few fries short of a Happy Meal. Because if only the last century, just the last 100 years have taught us anything, the richest century that has ever lived, the most educated century that has ever lived, the highest developed industrial and engineered societies that have ever lived on the planet, and yet we still do not live at peace. Two world wars, the Nazi Holocaust, Stalin's brutal massacre of 60 million of his own, Pol Pot's eliminating the entire educated class. Rwanda, Iraq, Darfur, Kosovo, Serbia, Myanmar, Pakistan, North Korea, and the list goes on and on and on and on. The nightly news does not look like the world is getting better. The nightly news looks like chaos is growing out of order. 
So what the scripture says is that our father, the first Adam, plunged the family into sin and death. And then fast forward, and this is where it gets cool. The first Adam plunged us into death, but there was another man who had a standoff with Satan as well. Jesus has been baptized, declared the Lamb of God, who will take away the sins. And then he is whisked away for 40 days of testing, prayer, and fasting, and isolation. And then Satan shows up, and Satan has been here before. The first Adam caved into his deceptive words. So he comes to Jesus when Jesus is weak and his strategy is much the same. Offer what sounds like an incredible prize. Freedom and wealth and power and pleasure. Name your price, Jesus. It can be yours. Just bend your knee. I can give you all that you want, if you will just worship me, if you will just enthrone me, if you will let me have the exalted seat that I actually tried so hard once to win. But the second Adam, Jesus, does not take the bait. Praise the Lord. And Satan's power over the human race was dealt the first lethal blow when Jesus says, I won't bend the knee. Matthew 4, Jesus said, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Do you realize that in that moment, no person ever in human history had ever said no to Satan up till that point in time? Is that not a shocking thing? No one had ever said no to him until this moment. Robert Weber says this. He says, Jesus' refusal to bow to Satan signaled an important moment in the work of overcoming the power of Satan. Jesus' rejection of Satan's power and affirmation of his service to God alone reversed the trend initiated by Adam when he chose Satan over God in the garden. Adam was seduced by the word of Satan and brought the whole human race under his influence. So Jesus broke the power of that seduction and set in motion the events that would ultimately and conclusively destroy the power of Satan. I think what Jesus is saying to Satan in that moment is not on my watch. It is not going to happen now that I am here. And the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus tells us that Satan was enthroned, dethroned. His supremacy over the human race is broken. And as Jesus walks out of the tomb on the first day of the week, his victory is powerfully confirmed and that all that is left is the mopping up. And I'm sure you've heard the illustration many times. It is the difference between June 6th, 1944 and May 8th, 1955. That June 6th, D-Day, when 100,000 troops land on the north shores of France, we know the war was effectively won. It was finished. It was done. But it took 11 months mopping up and finishing it until victory in Europe was declared. The church exists for this reason and this reason alone, to declare that there is freedom in Christ. Colossians 1 and 2 say this, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son. And then chapter 2 says, He's disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in Him. Galatians 5, It is for freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And then I want to go back to one phrase in your memory banks from John 11. When we were standing at Lazarus' graveside, he comes out of the tomb, and then Jesus, the last words in that paragraph are, get him out of those grave clothes. This dead man is now coming out of the tomb, get him out of those, dead, dead, those grave clothes. And here is where we need to think carefully and biblically. Because the cross and the empty tomb are impossible to separate. They're like two sides of the same coin. So Bonhoeffer's very famous phrase, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. That is true. He is reflecting Jesus' words, Luke 14. Whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Jesus saying, take up your cross and die. And so the point is well taken that we don't get to the empty tomb except through the cross. That we have to come to the point of surrender and taking our hands and releasing our control of our life and putting Jesus in the driver's seat, giving him the ownership manual, whatever you want to describe it as, but saying, I agree with you, Lord, that you have the right to absolute authority over my life. And until we get to that point of crucifixion and dying, we will never experience the power of the resurrection. We get to the empty tomb through the cross. But having done so, 
that just as we were crucified with Christ, so too we are raised in victory. And so sin no longer has power over us. We are free, not just in the future one day we are free, but we are a joyful and a joy-filled people. And this was the power on display in the early church, not just that they believed in a crucified Christ, but they believed in a fully victorious, ruling and reigning, resurrected Christ. And one last quote, and we're done. N.T. Wright says this, because the early Christians believed that the resurrection had begun with Jesus and would be completed in the great final resurrection on the last day. This next sentence is so key. They believed that God had called them to work with him in the power of the Spirit to implement the achievement of Jesus and thereby to anticipate the final resurrection in personal and political life, in mission and in holiness. Those who belonged to Jesus and followed him were empowered by his Spirit and were charged with transforming the present as far as they were able in light of the future. In other words, our today should be different in light of the future. We don't just live hanging around, all this world sucks, but eventually the Lord's going to redo it and we just got to endure until then. No, we walk in victory, bringing the kingdom into play today. So the one question that I leave with you is, are you living Sunday? Are you living in victory? Are you living with your your head held high, Christus Victor, he is Lord, giving Satan and every demon the very clear message that it is a brand new day and that we aren't just hanging around, we aren't just enduring the pain and suffering of a broken world, we aren't just clinging on in hope until the day of resurrection, but we are actively living as agents of change in the here and now. Yes, the cross is a vital component of the salvation story. Because it was there that Jesus paid the penalty. But the story does not end at the cross. What's the danger? That if we focus only on the death and the sacrifice and the suffering, which are all true, we might come away with a version of Christian life that is all about cost and suffering. Lay your life down, take your cross and follow me. And that is all true. But to forget that the Jesus that we worship and serve is seated now at the right hand of the Father, that he is ruling and reigning, and we're fighting the battle that he has already won. The message of Easter was the central message of the early church. The power of the resurrected Christ given to his people, it was that Christ was raised and a new day had come. And friends, I believe that the day and times that we are living in right now in 2023 call us for Easter Sunday living. I think what's happening in our culture is calling the bluff of nominal Christianity. I think you can no longer just check off on the census box, I'm a so-called Christian, check or not, because the culture is no longer going to stand for it. But lives that are lived in the power and the victory of Jesus, lives that acknowledge and celebrate the gift given to us at Calvary, but lives lived in the power of the empty tomb. We're going to spend five weeks, the next five weeks, talking about the power that God has given to the church, the church that he is building, a church that Jesus said, I will build and the gates of hell cannot stand against it. A church that is built for his glory. A church that is here for the good of the city. A church that is here that we would build one another up unto our full flourishing in Christ. A church that is here for the good of the nations. And a church that is here for the sake of the family. All of those reasons we live our daily lives in the power of the resurrection. So what if we intentionally added in our minds one more icon? The cradle, the cross, and the crown, but what if we remember to insert in there the cradle, the cross, the empty tomb, and the crown? Have you heard his call from death? And have you taken off those grave clothes? Are you walking in resurrection life? Just stand together, and I want to pray for you. We'll sing on our way. So Lord Jesus, uh, I pray that even in this weekend, you would be calling men and women to life in two ways. I pray for those who have never yet answered the call, that first call of the good shepherd who calls to his sheep and calls us out of the grave of our sin, out of spiritual deadness into life, that their hearts would be awakened, warmed, quickened, that they would be drawn, that this weekend would be the weekend of salvation when they finally say, yes, that is what I need. 
But Father, I also pray that you would call a lot of dead Christians into spiritual life as Christians. They are alive, spiritually speaking, but they're living with their grave clothes still clinging to them. And Lord, that they would know the explosive power of a new affection, that they would know the difference that the power of the Holy Spirit lived out in our daily lives makes in our workplaces and in our families and in our schools and in every day of every breath of life that you give us, that we would not be living Friday lives, but we would be living in the power of Sunday resurrection. And so, Father, I ask that, that you do that good work among us for your glory. And we know that as you are glorified, we have incredible joy. And so, Lord, we ask it for those two reasons in Jesus' name. Amen.